Well, church, I hope that worship time and prayer time has been encouraging to your heart and soul. Today, we're going to start a new sermon series that I have been really excited about, and that is one on church history. And I don't know how you feel about church history. Different people have different uh, reactions to it. Some people get really, really excited. Some people don't. I'm wondering if you might be more or less along the lines of Henry Ford when he said, history is more or less bunk. Henry Ford is a futurist. He was always looking forward. He didn't care what was behind him. Or maybe you resonate more with the words of George Santayana, who said, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. I don't know where you fall in that. I've actually thoroughly loved church history. I took a couple of courses at it, both at a bachelor level and at a master's level, and I absolutely loved it. There's something about church history that is captivating to see the formation of how we got really from the New Testament through to today. Why are we the way that we are? I think there's something really amazing, and I think it's really important for us as followers of Jesus to recognize that we are actually part of an ancient faith. Our church did not spring up on September 8th, 2019. No, it actually began thousands of years ago, right? With the beginning really of Christ, the beginning of the church. And so what we have here is we have this beautiful uh, tapestry happening uh, of the story of God throughout the ages of how God has been with his people, how he's challenged his people, uh, the political things that are happening at the same time. And what I have found is a lot of people, what they'll do with church history is they make uh, kind of three categories. They'll do um, Bible, and that seems one category, and then old history, and that's a second category, and they're not related. And then you have church history, which is kind of related to both. When the reality is, it's all one. History is history. And there are amazing things that are happening in the world around when things are, are happening uh, in the Bible. Like, for example, did you know that in the book of Daniel, it talks about Alexander the Great hundreds of years before he comes. But what we see is the reason the Romans have been able to conquer the world in the New Testament is because of some of the historical pieces. Some of the characters that you know of in the Bible, uh, like King Artaxerxes, were real people that are documented in history. Uh, and the Bible interweaves its story in real history in a, such a beautiful way. And so the reason I think that we need to be studying the Bible, or sorry, we should be studying church history, is because it shows the work of God through the ages. It doesn't just give us this one snapshot of, what life was like in first century Palestine, uh, first century Israel, and then we have us. No, it shows how God's been working throughout the ages, and which is an encouraging thing because sometimes we go through seasons where it doesn't seem like God's doing much, does it? Sometimes it feels like we're wondering where is God in the middle of it. But when you look back in history, you see all the ways that God was working. It gives us this uh, much longer perspective to give us the strength to endure the times that we're in. I think the studying church history is great because it also gives us both warnings and hope. It gives us warnings of the threats to the church. For example, there was a, uh, uh, there was a church in the eastern part of the world that went east from Jerusalem uh, through uh, what we would call modern day Iran and uh, over towards India and into China and Japan that was alive for a thousand years and thriving. Uh, and then it was wiped out in persecution, like absolutely eliminated. And so it gives us this warnings of the threats that face us. It gives us hope, though, that even though those things have happened and churches have gone through such terrible times in history, that it actually has helped us to survive. We have become a, a group of survivors where we have seen God progress us for 2,000 years 
to where we are here today in Stratford, Ontario, right? And so it gives us hope that we're gonna survive everything that the world throws at it. You wanna throw a pandemic at the church? That's okay, we're gonna get through it. Why? Because we got through the 1918 plague. We got through the bubonic plague. We got through every sort of thing that has come. We've gone through wars. We've gone through uh, times when Christianity was the peak of civilization and we had all of the power to times when we had none of the power we were persecuted minority group we've been through it all and we're still here and that gives me hope that gives me hope in fact one of the reasons i think it's so important that we study church history is look at this quote here uh, by dave uh, mcculloch he said history is who we are and why we are the way we are and that's true for good or for bad for the things that are problematic in the church result from our history, from our history. And the things that are great about us as a church are because of our history that stretches back these couple thousand years. History is who we are and why we are the way we are. And so to begin this series, I actually want to look at uh, the beginning, really, of what I'm going to call the church history, which was the event, the resurrection, the resurrection of Jesus. You see, everything falls upon that, right? Our faith is not in the Bible, and our faith is not in our feelings. Our faith is not even in the institution that we call the church. Our faith is in Jesus, that not only did he die, he was resurrected back to life. That is the cornerstone of our faith. That is the foundation of everything else we believe. If we agree on that part, we can continue to move forward. And so what I want to look at today is the resurrection as a historical fact. And so today is not going to be as story-based. Today is going to be really about showing from the scriptures, from the Bible, and from some external sources and some logic of why I think the resurrection was a historical event. It happened. It wasn't a myth invented centuries later, decades later, uh, from the time of Jesus by his followers. I think it really did happen. I'm going to show you some things why. Well, the first thing I want to look at is this idea here uh, that Paul talks about as a reason for this. See, Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 14. If Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. You see, this is why it's so important, I think, we start with the resurrection. Because if the resurrection isn't true, then we, our faith is useless. It's pointless. It doesn't have an end goal to it. It's a comfort food at the very best. And the work that Paul was doing, the preaching, was absolutely a waste of his time. In fact, he would say that a lot of his life would be wasted if the resurrection was not true. But if it is true, if the inverse is, is true here, if Christ has been raised, then our preaching is useful and our faith is useful. It has a point, it has a purpose, which is the reason why I wanna look at some of the historical evidences for the resurrection. First thing I wanna look at is this, the Roman opposition. So Rome is the occupying force that is in Israel at the time. They've taken over most of the uh, kind of Mediterranean base and world at this point. They were a, um, a uh, pluralistic society, uh, polytheistic with multiple gods. They did not care about monotheism. They did not care about Jewish religion in any way, shape, or form. Uh, they cared about keeping peace and growing the empire. Well, Jesus comes on the scene and he causes a ruckus amongst the Jewish people in Israel. He is um, persecuted by the Jewish officials, and they end up convincing the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, to crucify Jesus. And for Rome, they don't care about that too much. That's fine. They'll do it. Whatever. Well, they crucified Jesus. But, and it talks about here in the book of Matthew in chapter 27, just before this, how the people, the chief priests of the Jewish, Jewish, Jewish isn't a word, the Judaism or of the Jewish law, the chief priests, they went to Pilate and they said, 
Hold on, Pilate. The, the followers of Jesus said that he would rise again. So we ought to make sure that the body is protected so they can't steal it. So you need to post a guard. And so Pilate goes, fine, take a guard. Go and make the, term, the tomb where Jesus is buried as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting a guard. So the way that this works is that Jesus is in a tomb, which is a hole cut into a rock with some steps going down and some beds that were um, carved out of the rock. And Jesus would be uh, in death laid on what, that bed. And then they would take the stone and they would roll it in front. Now we're not talking like a stone. We're talking like a stone. Like this is hard. This is multiple grown men, strong soldiers, tr working hard to barely roll it. In fact, most people think that it was somewhere around two tons to move this stone. This would have been loud, it would have been heavy, and it would have been difficult. And they put the stone in front of the hole that you would use to get down into it in order to um, protect the body and protect other people so that the smell of decay didn't come out. Well, Jesus is laying in there. They put the stone, and then on top of that, on the stone, they put the seal on it. And kind of like an envelope seal. You know how uh, you, you lick it and it, the only way to really open it again is you're going to rip that paper? Well, the only way to open up the tomb again would be to rip off the seal uh, to, to remove it. And on top of that seal, they also had a guard. They put guards there to protect what was going on so that, uh, so you got a couple of guards who are trained Roman soldiers, experts in execution standing guard watching this, okay? And so for the disciples to sneak in and steal the body would be almost impossible. You see, because the Roman guards, they know the truth that if they fail in their duty, if they were to be, say, overpowered, knocked out, and somebody came in and steal the body, their own superiors would kill them. They would stab them and, and kill them and dump them in a grave. So they're not, they're motivated to be focused. They're motivated in order to make sure that this tomb does not open. So I think this is one of kind of the first of the evidences is there's Roman opposition uh, of experts and soldiers protecting Jesus' tomb for the three days that he is in there. And the second one is this. Um, the Jesus appears first and foremost, to women, right? The women, now the women, depending on the account in the gospel you're looking for, it's probably Mary, Mary, uh, Mary Magdalene, I should say, Mary, the mother of Jesus, Salome, which I think was Mary's sister, uh, Jesus is one of his sisters. Um, there were some women that had come in order to uh, do the proper burial rites for Jesus's body. They were gonna plead to be let in so they could do the proper burial rites. Uh, when they got there on the third day after the Sabbath, the tomb's already open. They have this encounter with angels. And as they're leaving, all of a sudden, afraid and filled with joy because the tomb is empty and these angels say he's not here, they ran to tell the disciples. And suddenly, Jesus met him. Suddenly, Jesus met them. The first people that Jesus reveals himself to in, uh, after the resur or as for the resurrection, after his death, are the women. And the reason this is astounding is, if you were to make up this story decades later, you would never say this. You see, women in this century weren't considered um, reliable witnesses. Their testimony was never admissible in court. So if women caught you doing a bunch of stuff and they went to testify, the judge wouldn't believe them. They would believe you instead, simply because they were women. It's not right. It was just a patriarchal society that they lived in. And so for Jesus to first appear to women is amazing because Jesus is this ultimate feminist who empowers women and uh, they become the first preachers of the resurrection, actually. But he appears to them First. And if you were to make up this story, it would take away all credibility if you were to say that the women were the first to see, that the women's testimony was valid. It would be absolutely ridiculous, and people would not believe you on that. 
And so to me, this is another evidence that the, uh, what is written in the Bible about the resurrection is true, because this would be a bad way to make it up, right? People wouldn't believe you, okay? Um, and then we come into this amazing passage uh, in the book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians is written about 15 to 20 years after the resurrection uh, by the Apostle Paul. He has uh, in prison, uh, he is uh, serving God, he is, uh, has encountered Jesus. And in 1 Corinthians 15, he outlines quite a lot of information about the resurrection that we're going to be looking at today. And the thing that we see in this, uh, in this one, in 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 3, is that there were a bunch of eyewitnesses to the uh, resurrection. For I received what I, uh, for I, for what I received, I should say, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas. So I'm going to pause here. He appeared to Cephas. Now, if you don't know, Cephas is a form of the name Peter. And so the first person that Paul says that Jesus appeared to um, is Peter. Now, Paul's not taking into account that he appeared to the women or anything like that, but that he appeared to Peter. The reason he does this is this is about establishing Peter as one of the primary authorities over the ancient church. Uh, the disciple uh, that Jesus said, upon this rock, upon you, Peter, I'm going to build my church. And Peter had uh, rejected Jesus and then been restored, and Paul is affirming it, right? Peter's preeminent in the church. So if you appeared first to Peter, and then to the 12, it says. It says then he appeared to the 12. And this is fascinating, because the 12 is now a designated title, because there's not actually 12. Judas has killed himself by this point, so there's only 11 at this stage. But they are still called the 12, Right? And Jesus appeared to them. We see stories of that, where they're in the upper room. They're afraid. They don't know what's going on. And Jesus shows up. And even Thomas right, gets to touch the risen Lord. He gets to feel, see the hands and touch him. And Jesus eats with them. Absolutely amazing. But he appears not only to Peter, but to the twelve. After that, right, same passage, he continues on, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. So it's one thing if it's like, well, he appeared to a couple of the Bible characters, you know, Peter and the 12. Now he's saying he appeared to 500 brothers and sisters at the same time. Uh, now, when did he do this? Well, when you look in the book of Matthew, chapter 28, and Jesus is giving the um, great commission at the end of the book, how he closes it, most scholars assume that it's not just the 12 that are there, but it's actually this 500, uh, that he's giving this commission to make disciples to all of them and to all of us. He's given it to 500 brothers and sisters, most of whom are still living. And this is an interesting thing. Paul's writing this, and it's going to get passed around from church to church. Most of them are still living. So that means if they're not telling the truth, there are people who would be able to refute it, who would say, no, that didn't happen. Here's what really happened. But what happened, but it didn't happen in history. There was no refutation um, by people who said, no, I wasn't there or whatever, right? Um, most of them fall asleep. That means they died. Then he appeared to who? To James. And this one is significant to me. James is not like James of James and John. This James is James, the half-brother of Jesus. Jesus had a special appearance to his brother because his brother didn't believe in him. When you look through the Bible, when you look at um, uh, Mark chapter 3, verses 21 and verse 31, and then later on in John chapter 7, verses 3 to 5, you see that James didn't believe in Jesus. He thought he was crazy. You see that James wasn't there when Jesus was crucified. That's why Jesus gave a stewardship of his mother to the disciple John. Because James' brother wasn't there. He didn't believe in him. He didn't agree with him. But Jesus showed up in his life as a resurrected king. And what happened? James put his faith in Christ and ended up becoming the leader of the church in Jerusalem. 
right? The very city where Jesus died, Peter, or James, I should say, his half-brother becomes the leader of the church there because he encountered Christ. He was not somebody who believed, who wanted it to be true. This was his crazy brother. This is somebody that didn't believe and then showed up afterwards. Then it says, to all of the apostles. But we already had the 12 mentioned in the previous uh, verse, right? Uh, then to all the apostles, we saw the 12. So who are all the apostles? The apostles weren't limited just to 12 people. There were lots of different people designated as apostles. Apostles just means sent ones, messengers. And so the uh, people that were sent out to go do this ministry, there were lots. Um, Apollo uh, and Apollos and Priscilla, they were apostles, right? Barnabas, I believe, was considered an apostle. There were other apostles other than the 12. And Jesus appeared to all of the ones that existed uh, in those 40 days before his ascension. And last of all, he appeared to me also. So who's me? It's Paul the Apostle writing this, saying he showed, came to my life. And the reason this is so significant, even though he kind of seems to bury it, is that Paul did not ever want Jesus to be alive. He had in his life, in his mission, to destroy this heretical sect that were called Christians, that were the way, because they were perverting the true faith in Judaism by following this false Messiah, Jesus. And so if there's anybody who didn't want Jesus to be alive, it was Paul. In fact, he was on his way to Damascus, the capital of Syria, in order to destroy more of the church there, more of the Christians, to throw them in jail, to beat them, to murder them, to do whatever it took to stop the church. He was on his way to do that when he met the resurrected Jesus on the road. To, uh, on the road. It caused him to blindness, and then it caused him to truly see, to see that Jesus was real, that Jesus was alive. It's one thing when you're like hoping and wishing for somebody uh, to come back that left. It's another thing to be like, the last person I ever want to see in my life would be Jesus. And he shows up to the Apostle Paul and transforms him in a moment. So I think you see the eyewitness accounts are another one of the evidences that the resurrection is true. Personally, and maybe not everybody would agree with me, I would also say the exponential growth of the church is another evidence, right? Uh, Peter is preaching, and uh, he preaches, and he says, God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Paul, Peter's entire sermon is based on the resurrection of Jesus, that he is God who came back to life. And then what happened? Well, later on in the passage, those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 added to their number the day. 3,000 who not long before were standing there and they were screaming, crucify him, crucify him, are now turning to follow him because the message of the resurrection. If the message of the resurrection was false, I don't believe it would have had as much ground. But there was enough eyewitness testimony. There was enough, um, there was no body that anybody could find. And people believed in this early church type season that Jesus really did come back from the dead that in the early time, right after his death, people embraced this message. We see it again later on in the next chapter, chapter three. Uh, Peter, I love Peter's bluntness, to some of the Pharisees. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this, right? Very blunt language. He goes to a bunch of religious leaders. But many who believe, who heard the message believed. And so the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. In two sermons recorded, Peter creates a mega church. Why? Based off of the resurrection of Jesus. Not based on making people feel good. Not based on uh, the great music that they were able to have. No, based off the message of the resurrection of Jesus that God added to the church thousands and thousands of people who would then spread out through the entire Roman Empire. Right, And so you see these things, you see this exponential growth. I think another evidence of the resurrection is that the early uh, church experienced some deep persecution about it, and it didn't stop them. 
Okay, in Acts chapter five, G, uh, Peter and John are brought before the Sanhedrin, the ruling people, uh, the ruling body, I should say, of the Jewish leaders. And uh, they were saying, hey, stop preaching in Jesus' name. What is Peter's response? The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. Again, Peter's very tactful and blunt. Uh, so he hangs the, the whole thing on the on these Jewish leaders. The God of our ancestors raised him from the dead. He proclaims the resurrection even to those who were the architects of his own death. And when they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. They ended up flogging them. So what they ended up doing is they ended up hurting them badly, right? Uh, his Gamaliel is, uh, speaks, right, uh, to, to bring this up, and he says, hold on, let's not kill them. If it doesn't amount to anything, then God's going to stop it. If it's true, we don't want to fight God. So the speech persuaded them. They called the apostles and had them flogged. What was flogging? Flogging is when they would take a whip, okay? Uh, they'd have a wood handle, they'd wrap it in leather, and then there would be usually nine strands of leather that would come off of that handle, and they would tie bone and glass and bits of metal into that so that when they whipped you, it would grab into the skin and bite in and pull the skin away when they pulled it back. And a flogging would be uh, 40 minus one. They would do 39 lashes along their back. Jesus himself experienced this just before his crucifixion. Paul experiences it at least twice in his lifetime. And the disciples um, uh, were commanded not to preach in the name of Jesus, and they were flogged. They endured this brutal torture. And what were the apostles' response? They left the Sanhedrin rejoicing. Rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. They saw this persecution that was all based on the, their belief in the resurrection as something to be welcomed. They were fine with it. And this is one of those things that if the apostles were trying to fool everybody and trying to make up a uh, religion. They went a long way then for a lie, if that was to be true. Like they would went through excruciating torture at the hand of the Romans. Most of the apostles would die in um, uh, some form of persecution uh, because of this belief. And it's one thing to, to give your life because of something you believe in. It's another thing to give your life for something you know is a lie. That doesn't resonate well with me. But they believed in it so, so passionately. They were willing to endure this huge amounts of persecution that we see in the Gospels and in the book of Acts. You know, when we look at the whole idea of the um, resurrection of Jesus, it's one of those things that's a bit historically unnatural. Is not something that anybody would leave to. Uh, New Testament scholar N.T. Wright, he wrote this. The early Christians did not invent the empty tomb and the meeting or the sightings of the risen Jesus. Nobody was expecting this sort of thing. There's no like Old Testament theology around resurrection that was really overt, that was obvious. Nobody was expecting it. No kind of conversion experience would have invented the idea of resurrection. No matter how guilty or how forgiven they felt, no matter how many hours they poured over the scriptures, the Old Testament, to suggest otherwise is to stop doing history and to enter into a fantasy world of our own. You see, the disciples wouldn't have made up the narrative of the resurrection. It didn't make sense to people. It, didn't, it wasn't something that it was a logical outflow of what they expected. And so uh, you, you have this amazing um, sense now that the disciples are entering into this realm of the new, of doing something that has never been done before. And so we have some of this external evidence like this doesn't make any sense. I also have this one. How about some little bit of logic here, right? Um, the mission of the saints, the idea of the resurrection, 
was so life-changing. It took people who had jobs, who had careers, who had families, and completely changed their life so that those who believed they saw Jesus would travel throughout the Roman Empire proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus. Right? Some stayed in Jerusalem, some went up to Macedonia, uh, some went into uh, Rome and preached there, like Paul. Uh, you see Thomas went eastward and made it all the way to India and beyond in order to do it, northern Africa. The Christians who saw the resurrection moved all throughout the major populated world of the time in order to preach this good news that Jesus came back alive. And you don't do that for something that's fake, right? You don't change your whole life around something that isn't true, that you know that isn't true. You do it because it's a real belief. They truly, utterly, with all their heart, 100% believe that the resurrection happened. And they were willing to die for it. They were willing to die to testify that the resurrection of Jesus happened, which is what most of them did. Now, there's some theories of opposition that I want to look at, too, right? Uh, there's some theories that Jesus didn't actually die on the cross, which doesn't make a ton of sense. I mean, there's a theory about mass hallucination that is a well-documented, real phenomenon, so they must have just mass hallucinated it. Um, and there are others, too. But I want to look at this idea called the minimal facts approach. Minimal facts are what are the minimal things that we can agree on are relatively true, or not relatively, are, are, are universally accepted for the most part. Uh, and then are they the best um, explanation for the facts, right? And so in the minimalist facts approach, there's three principles that almost all historians agree on. The first one is this, Jesus existed and was crucified. Jesus existed and was crucified. There is very little doubt among any reputable scholars for the existence of Jesus Christ of Nazareth and that he was crucified in the time period that it happened, right? Everybody agrees that on evidence that's true. Second thing is, is that Jesus' followers really believed that he was resurrected. They truly believed it with all of their heart. The third thing that is really uncontested is that the people who were not followers of Jesus really believed he was resurrected. People like James, people like Peter, um, and more. People who were not already followers really believed that he was resurrected. Well, based on these things, three things, when you look at the fact that did Jesus really die? Well, one, it goes against what we all know about the Roman crucifixion process. That, and these were, Roman soldiers were experts at killing. This is what they were paid to do for a living. And they knew Jesus was dead. Not only was he not breathing anymore, but it says he gave up his spirit, he stopped breathing, because the cross prevents you from breathing. You actually die of asphyxiation. They stabbed him in the stomach, and so the contents of his stomach, water, and the blood of the impact poured out of him. And so he was most definitely dead. They knew him to be dead, these experts. And most um, historians agree with that truth. So for people to simply say, oh, no, Jesus didn't really die, is to say, no, everybody's wrong. And when you think that everybody's wrong in something, it's actually probably you're the one who's a little wrong. Well, the second thing is that Jesus followers really believed. So these mass hallucinations, are they even possible? Well, it's hard because it takes place over multiple days. It wasn't just once. The um, appearances of Jesus happened over 40 days between his resurrection and his ascension. And then Paul's testimony, which is even after that, right? But it wasn't just a mass hallucination. It was something that was so profound that the early believers really believed he was resurrected. And the people who didn't want it to be true also believed it. They also believed it. Paul did not want Christianity to be true. He was trying to destroy it, and it turns out that he was wrong. And so some of the um, reasons, the alternate theories that people give don't hold up in the minimalist fact theories of being logically uh, unassailable to what we're doing here. But 
All that is said, those are some of the evidences that we have for the resurrection of Christ. And for some of you, that's a little bit interesting. For some of you, it's pretty dull. And I understand that, and I totally respect that. But I think it's important for us to know it. You see, the world wants us to have an answer for the question, well, what, is that even possible, that Jesus died and came back to life? Because it's the foundation of faith, and we need to believe that. We need to believe that it was a historically grounded event, because if it isn't, then our whole faith is completely useless. If Jesus only resurrected in a spiritual sense, then our faith is empty. But if he resurrected in real life, then our faith is substantial, it is real, and it is hope for everyone. And it also means that it's good news for us. The resurrection of Jesus is good news for you and for me. It means something. It means that we can have salvation. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 17 says, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. You are still in your sins. You can have salvation because it wasn't spiritual. It was reality. If we are still in our sins, if Jesus didn't die, then we're still under God's wrath. Right? Ephesians 5, 6 says that because of things like idolatry and immorality and sin, God's wrath comes upon those who are disobedient. But if it's true that Jesus has been raised from the dead, then it's also true that our faith is not futile, that we can have salvation. We are saved. We've been saved from the penalty of our sin, right? That God's wrath, we've been removed from God's wrath, and now we sit in the blessing of God's love. We have been saved from the power of sin that so easily ties us up and keeps us from living this abundant life that Jesus promised us, right? The chains are broken and we have been set free because the resurrection uh, proves that even death doesn't stop it. If the resurrection of Jesus is historically true, then we're no longer slaves to sin, but we have been set free in Christ. And I don't know about you, I think that's good news. I think that's good news. I also think that we can have hope if the resurrection is true. 1 Corinthians 15, 9, just two verses later. If only for this life we've got hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. He's like, if Jesus didn't die, if our hope is only for here because it's some spiritual internal thing, then we should be pitied because we're not even living in reality. We're not living in truth. But because Jesus has been raised from the dead, we can have hope. We can have hope that death doesn't win, right? It didn't defeat Jesus. It's not going to defeat us. There's hope that there is a future worth fighting for. There is hope that one day God will wipe away every tear from our eyes because there will be no more death. There will be no more pain. There will be no more shame. There will be no more sin. There will be no more racism. There will be no more sexism. There will be no more injustice in our world. All of those things will get passed away. Why? Because Jesus came back from the dead. He was victorious over the power of death and gives us hope that we can have a better life, a better future. We live as people of hope, knowing that because Jesus was raised from the dead, nothing is impossible for God. Knowing that because Jesus was raised from the dead, we are now convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor uh, present or future, nor uh, heights or depths or, high, or, or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing will separate us from God's love because Jesus came back from the dead. So we can have salvation and we can have hope and we can have purpose. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, um, verses uh, 56 to 58, says that the sting of death is sin, but uh, the power and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my brother, dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain, right? You know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain, right? So that means we have purpose 
right? That the resurrection gives us purpose. The historical reality means that what you do matters. If the resurrection wasn't true, right? If life is just about, well, we exist, and then one day we stop existing, then it has no meaning. It has no purpose. I can't see why we would bother with goodness or with morality or with, you know, taking care of our environment to pass it on. If it's only about we live, we die, we move on, that's it, then it has no meaning. But if, if the resurrection is true, then there are real and eternal consequences for the decisions we make today. Right? We can either help people move towards God and into eternal life with him or away from God. N.T. Wright um, says it like this. The message of the resurrection is that this world matters. That the injustices and pains of this present world must now be addressed with the news that healing, justice, and love have won. If Easter means Jesus Christ is only raised in a spiritual sense, then it's only about me and finding a new dimension in my personal spiritual life. But if Jesus is truly risen from the dead in a historical context, Christianity becomes good news for the whole world. News which warms our hearts precisely because it isn't just about warming our hearts. Easter means that in a world where injustice, violence, and degradation are endemic, God is not prepared to tolerate such things. He's not prepared to leave it alone and ignore us. He's doing something about it through the resurrection. And that we will work and plan with all the energy of God to implement victory of Jesus over them all. Over them all. We have a purpose because the resurrection of Jesus uh, and our purpose is to reveal the kingdom of God to a broken world and to offer the gift of life that is found in faith in Christ. See, Christianity is not just spiritual. It's rooted in history. I want to be real with you. Is there airtight evidence that fully proves everything? No. No, because God wants us to relate to him by faith, not by knowledge. Live by faith, not by sight. No, critics have attacked and denounced uh, many of these very arguments for many, many years now. But is there enough evidence that when considered can lead us to a reasoned faith that is rooted in a historical event? I believe so. I believe so. I bet my life on this truth. I believe that God stepped into time and, a pl and space into a specific time and place in order to save people who were dead in their sin through and through his death and resurrection, he came to offer them life. And I believe God is inviting you and I to live by faith and not by sight. He doesn't invite us to ignore reality and take blind leaps of dubious faith. No, he invites us to use our minds to investigate the claims and to choose. And I choose Jesus. What about you? You see, the resurrection to me demands a response. Maybe you're watching this video on YouTube and thinking, well, what do I really believe about the resurrection of Jesus? And if that's you, I hope you will seriously look and consider whether or not Jesus rose from the dead. Because that's the cornerstone of the Christian faith. That's what we built everything else upon, is that truth. And if you, like me, believe that he did, then why wouldn't you give your whole life to him? If you believe, if you reflect in your life that you believe that Jesus died and came back to life historically, then why would you not give your life to the God who is alive? Everyone else in history died and stayed dead. Jesus came back to life, ascended to the right hand of the Father, of God, and is now interceding for you, calling you into a new life in Christ. How do you get this life? You surrender yourself to God. And if you're ready to do that today, would you join me in prayer? Jesus, 
for all the people that are watching at home, who through your Holy Spirit you have been speaking to, that you have been reminding them of maybe an ancient story in their lives that Jesus died and came back to life. Would you stir that up? And if you've been stirring that up in them this time that I've been speaking and helping them see that it's not an unreasonable uh, leap of faith to get there, and if, God, you've been working in their hearts and they're ready to follow you, would you, God, do the amazing miracle and draw them into your family? God, would you help them through the Holy Spirit to turn their lives to you? And if they are praying this right now and they're ready to give their lives, Father God, hear them. Hear their hearts. Know that in their sin they now turn to you. And so, God, we turn to you, all of us, and recognize that we are sinners before you, a holy God, that we have done wrong and done evil in our lives. We are full of guilt. But because you died and came back to life, and in so doing, you paid the debt, you paid the penalty uh, for our sin, we now have life in you. And we recognize, God, we surrender our lives to you. You are good. We love you. We thank you. Jesus, walk with us. Spirit, come and fill us in the name of Christ. Amen and amen. You know, if you prayed that prayer, if you made that decision to follow Christ today, if you're willing to do that, I want to encourage you. Would you please reach out and email me, right? Uh, my email is here on the screen right now. We'd love for you to, to, to reach out and contact so I can walk with you a little bit more about what are the next steps. And so send me that email and, uh, and to encourage you. And if you've been following Jesus for a while now, I hope that today you will be reminded and encouraged by the amazing truth that God stepped into time and space as Jesus in order to save you, in order to give you hope, in order to give you an eternal purpose. Would you close in, in prayer with me one more time? Jesus, we just thank you for those three things. We thank you you gave us salvation. We thank you that you gave us hope. We thank you that you gave us eternal purpose. God, would you help us to walk all of our days proclaiming, enjoying, rejoicing in the truth that you stepped into history, that you lived, that you died, and that you came back to life, and that by faith in you, we have eternal life. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus. We say thanks. And all God's people said, amen.